Hello, you're watching Tech24 on France 24. I'm Julia Seeger. Coming up in the show, beekeeping may not seem the most high-tech of pastimes, but that's changing. We tell you how beekeepers and scientists are now using technology to help save honeybees. From remote monitoring systems and RFIDs to the study of their language, apiculturists are going high-tech. And in Test24, we'll take a look at a solar-powered cover for the e-reader Cybook Ocean by French company Bookin. But first, Frenchman Jean-Pierre Sauvage has been awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for 2016 after he helped develop the world's smallest machines. These molecular machines are a thousand times thinner than a strand of hair and have paved the way for the world's first smart materials. Sauvage is sharing the prize with two European colleagues. Charles Pelgrin has the story. Entering the scientific history books. Jean-Pierre Sauvage. 71-year-old Frenchman Jean-Pierre Sauvage, a Strasbourg University professor, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry at a press conference in Sweden alongside fellow chemistry researchers Sir Fraser Stoddart and Bernard Feringa. The trio developed the world's smallest machines, which are a thousand times thinner than a strand of hair, a major scientific breakthrough. My first reaction is obviously a great moment of happiness and, at the same time, a big surprise. The Nobel Prize is a really special prize. As you know very well, it's the most prestigious prize you can get, and one which most scientists don't dare dream about, not even their wildest dreams. Sauvage was born in Paris in 1944 and has achieved major breakthroughs in molecular machinery since the early 1980s. In 1983, he linked two ring-shaped molecules together to form a chain. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences said that the laureate's work will inspire other researchers to build increasingly advanced molecular machinery, seen as a new dimension of chemistry. Molecular machines are molecules with controllable movements, which can perform a task when energy is needed. The Academy says the machines made by the professors will likely be used in the development of new materials, sensors and energy storage systems. But in the future, they could revolutionize computer technology and lead to a new type of battery. French President François Hollande sent his congratulations to Sauvage, a man credited to have changed the face of chemistry. And it's time to welcome Dan and Jake Cattlecar on set. Hello and welcome, Dan. Hello, Julia. It's an extraordinary breakthrough, these molecular machines, and the report started touching up on how much of a tech turn it is. But let's dig a little bit deeper. Explain to us how these molecular machines work. Well, machines essentially consist of parts that move in relation to each other. Now, what uh, the other two recipients did was they carried forward uh, Professor Sawaj's work. So in, uh, in the first instance, it was Professor uh, uh, Stoddart who built a structure which is known as rotaxan. It consists of two molecules, one of which is in the shape of an axle and the other is a ring. So by combining these two molecules, he was able to make the ring move with a little burst of energy. So that was the break, that was the big breakthrough as well, because you could actually control these machines or you could make them move and um, uh, have a control over them as well. Uh, he also made uh, certain molecules lift. So in one experiment, he made them lift by 0.7 nanometers. And interestingly, he also created a computer chip based on these molecular machines with a capacity of 20 KB, which is not a lot, but it also represents or it also signifies a giant stride in the miniaturization, which could have great applications in the computer industry. Now, the third recipient, uh, Professor Feringa, he was the first one to create a molecular motor. So what he did was he managed to make these uh, motors uh, move in, in the similar directions. The big challenge was to make these motors move in one direction. So that's what he achieved. And of course, he also managed to, I, thought, I think this is very significant, he managed to make, he and his team managed to make a glass cylinder revolve. This glass cylinder, which measured 28 micrometers, was 10,000 times bigger than the molecular motors that were making it revolve. So this also was an important breakthrough. It will have, uh, you know, wider, uh, wider repercussions in terms right. of applications. How is it going to change our life? Well, first of all, in the field of medicine, uh, these motors, they can carry a drug and they can carry them to a specific uh, cell. So, for example, if there's a cancerous cell, these motors will carry the drug and target that cancerous cells and the rest of the healthy cells, they will be spared. Now, we know that chemotherapy is, a, is an effective treatment, but at the same time, it has a lot of side effects. Now, those can be avoided once 
this technology gets uh, developed to a proper, you know, to a sophisticated level. So medicine is one of the fields. The other fields, of course, is computer science, as I mentioned, uh, with the with miniaturization. We are already, you know, enjoying the benefits of miniaturization in the terms of chips we have. They are very tiny, and that's why they can be packed in tiny spaces, and we have more power in smaller devices. Now, molecular, um, uh, molecular machines, they are so tiny, they're smaller than the existing transistors, for example, right. and you can condense more and more of them, and you can have even more processing power in smaller smaller spaces. And then you have other uh, other applications like in the field of uh, fabrics, in the field of uh, energy devices, you can right. create new the batteries. The applications are endless. endless. Thank you so much, Dan. We're going to move on now to a whole other story. This week, several types of bee have made the U.S. endangered species list for the first time. Parasites, climate change, pollution, and pesticides have all been cited as potential reasons for the insect's decline. And here in France, a company is trying to help both Western honeybees and honeymakers thanks to a new device to help them keep track of their beehives remotely. Mark Thompson has the story. Getting up close and personal with beehives can be a dangerous task. But for beekeeper Alban Auger, it could be a thing of the past. Each of his 150 hives sits on a base filled with sensors that alert him to any abnormal change in behavior. It's capable of spotting if the temperature is becoming too volatile or if there's a predator on the site. The machines use a frequency which doesn't affect the bees' orientation or communication. These connected hives are geolocalized and they allow us to measure everything from the orientation, the temperature, the dampness, the light and the weight to the atmospheric pressure. Everything a beekeeper needs to know to see how his bees are doing. Users can avoid unnecessary trips to see their insects by using an app on their smartphone which will help them check the status of their hives. I base everything on the information I'm being given by the app. It means I can react quickly if something goes wrong. If it's good news, the dashboard can show when the hive is producing a lot of honey, but it can also tell me if it's bad news. Some 500 beehives are set to be equipped with the so-called connected base across France. The product is made in this factory south of Paris, which employs a dozen disabled workers. Beekeepers are hoping the device will not only help their business, but give the insect a boost. The bee population has dropped by around 30% over the past five years. A startling figure for a creature that pollinates a third of everything humans eat and which plays a vital role in sustaining the planet's ecosystems. And Dan, let's start talking about what scientists are doing to try to save the honeybee. In Australia, researchers have equipped bees with small backpacks, if I can say that, uh, to monitor their movements and try to understand why they're disappearing at such a fast rate. That's right. Researchers from the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial and Research Organization, or CSIRO, are involved in a project to protect bees. And for that, they have uh, mounted these microsensors on the back of the bees so they can monitor where these bees go. You can call them the black box devices of the bees. So through them, they can track their movement, they can uh, you know, study their pattern inside and outside the hives. At the same time, they can also look for stress factors that could be affecting bees like pollution, insecticides, temperature, humidity, and other different parameters. And now here in France, scientists believe that one day bees will be able to tell us, to communicate with us and tell us when something's going wrong. Yeah, it's a fascinating research and it's been undertaken by INRA, which is the French Agricultural Research Institute in Avignon. So the idea is that they have isolated uh, some frequencies, these buzzing frequencies, around four or five of them. And they are trying to determine if this is the way the bees communicate with each other, whether there's a different frequency for communication between worker bees and there's a different frequency for communication between queen bee and the worker bees. So it's quite fascinating because till now we only we know that uh, bees communicate through hormones. So this could open up something entirely new. And this goes also with the fact that, you know, recently there was news about cords uh, communicating amongst each right. other using sounds. That's right, Dan. And these cords actually have different dialects as well. And you know what? Let's take a listen to what these words would sound like. Here's the recording of the vibrations of several queen bees in Danu, France. <coughs> Pretty interesting. They sound like marine mammals. I thought they, some of them sounded like seagulls. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> 
And let's talk about one last project. Another way to help bees survive is to push the general public to have beehives and to help them. There's a new device that was developed. That's right. It's called Flow Hive, and it's quite revolutionary, both in terms of the innovation and in terms of the money it has attracted on its Kickstarter campaign. Uh, it's very simple. It essentially consists of honeycombs, which are vertically split. Uh, and once the bees come and deposit their honey in those combs, the, and uh, you have to turn a tap. And once you turn that tap, these, uh, these honeycombs get split and it turns into a channel. And the honey just gets, you know, it, it uh, moves through the channel and it gets uh, settled at the bottom of this uh, device. And you can just collect the honey at the, at the turn of the tap. And once you turn it back, the honeycomb is back in its place and the bees can start depositing honey again. Honey on tap. Thank you so much, Dan. It's time for Test 24. You've probably never heard of French e-reader maker Booking, but their latest product is well worth knowing about. Dan, tell us more about this cover with a leaf on it. It's beautiful. Right. It's a solar charger, and essentially what you have to do is you just keep this charger in the sun for one hour, and it will charge your e-book reader for the entire day. Uh, it looks pretty attractive. It's in the form of a leaf here. And the idea is that because they use transparent photovoltaic cells, you can change the design as well. Uh, it's an interesting concept because you don't need any charges, and that's how it should be. This uh, e-book reader should resemble a traditional book. So in that sense, it works. Uh, of course, uh, the, it is only compatible right now with the Cybook Ocean uh, e-book reader, and perhaps it could uh, inspire other uh, e-book makers to come up with such concepts. Thank you so much, Dan. Well, that's it from us here at Tech24, but do stay tuned to France 24. Thank you.